From childhood up, we have had to conform to a certain social game. And so we are in a constant state of competition. This is the secret. You can't make a mistake. Welcome, everyone, to Friends of Failure. I'm your host, Sam, and this is my co-host, Megan. Hey, yo. Uh, I would like to introduce you to a special guest today. Uh, this is uh, Yvonne Caputo. How you doing? I'm good. I'm uh, good. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. Uh, it's a beautiful Sunday. Um, so uh, we're very excited to have you here today. Um, and I did want to start, uh, you had mentioned to us before that uh, you did theater back in college, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, um, how long did you do that for? Well, I actually started in high school. They okay. did a play in high school and the bug bit. <laughs> and when I was in college, um, there was a pretty robust theater department. And I went and auditioned, and I basically auditioned for anything and everything that they were doing. And um, that led to uh, being really comfortable, you know, being in front of an audience. Um, all kinds of skills came out of that that, that I really pretty much treasure. Um, and one of the things that was so helpful was our drama coach, uh, Dr. Clifford, it was very clear prior to a performance that to be anxious, mm. that when we came for that performance, that she wanted us to be anxious because if we weren't anxious, we wouldn't do a good job. And so all the butterflies would happen and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that was also wonderful about it was once we started that performance, the energy between us and among us and the storyline itself kind of took over. Mm -hmm. And sooner than um, later, we were really into it. And I'd like to segue a little bit by saying how critical the audience was. Because if the audience was with us, if the audience was alive, then we were alive. But if the audience was dead, you know, we kind of fell flat on our face. So this is prior to my becoming a teacher. So I learned how critical that interplay between audience and, um, and players was really important to how well the production went. A hundred percent. And I could, I could imagine how strange it had to be to put those pieces together of, because you became a teacher. Uh, did you say what, what level you taught at? Well, I taught for 18 years. Oh, okay. Um, I started out in elementary. Um, and I had this knack of going in different directions as a teacher. I did fourth and fifth grade self-contained. I did fifth through eighth grade social studies. I did seventh grade English. And the final years of my teaching, um, I taught in a gifted program. Okay. And all of the students who came to us were really pretty bright. So I, I did a lot of different things in the school system. Yeah. And so during that, uh, you definitely had to, I guess, the same thing, right? If the audience didn't interact, it kind of changes the vibe of yeah. you being at the front of the class, right? It was, it was so instructive to be able to read my students. Mm. And to tell that they were bored to tears <laughs> or that they were, you know, they were really with me or, and actually your question made me think that it was the kids that really pushed me to be a storyteller mm. because it was when I was telling stories and the stories centered around what I wanted the kids to know, that's when they really became engaged. Yeah. So you know, along the way, what I really learned to do was to tell the story. A hundred percent. I have to ask the question. So did you, did, would you ever feel any of the anxiety, like before a performance, the same as before you taught a class? Oh, absolutely. Go? Oh, yeah. absolutely. 
I can um, only imagine. You, you ask about my career. Um, I met and married the most wonderful man in the whole wide world. And he had two children from a previous marriage. So there was no question as to the fact that I was going to move towards his direction rather than him coming to where I was. And I couldn't find a teaching job. However, when I interviewed, I had my master's in psychology at that point, when I interviewed for a counseling position, the first question out of the interviewer's mouth, my new boss was, would you be willing to do training? Well, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's going to be an adult audience now, but because I love an audience so much, then it gave me an opportunity to, to grow in a different direction. So those skills that I learned way back when on the stage were skills that I have taken with me in every career. And it's true for being a psychotherapist, mm -hmm. you know, reading my client and seeing, do they need a little humor? Do they, do they need my eyes to cheer up? Um, do they need me to lean into them because they're, they're giving me their life story? All of the things that I learned on the stage were really helpful in that direction too. Uh, I could definitely see that. Can you, uh, if you don't mind, can you kind of explain what it means to be a psychotherapist? People will come because they have an issue. Mm -hmm. There is something about their life that just isn't working. And what they would like is assistance of weeding through what those things are so that they can, they can live their life in a more productive kind of satisfying way. So when I went to graduate school and along the way, what I learned was what I call a bag of tricks. And I don't mean that in, in, in a negative way, like there's something hocus pocus to this. But I learned, to, let me say I have a bag of skills mm -hmm. that depending on whatever they're bringing to the table, there's something that I know that can help. Or there's a question that I can ask that will get them to think about something in a new light. Or it will just be having somebody tell them, you're okay. Yeah. This is normal. They're, you know, what you're feeling is normal to the situation that you've just been through you know to 100 so so that that's the kind of thing that i mean by being a psychotherapist that's pretty cool uh how long have you been doing that for 1985 okay so just for a minute just a little for bit just a minute or two yeah yeah i how think was, it's a uh, week week two <laughs> how was that uh it sounds like you're really good at pivoting and saying, hey, this is a, no longer an option. I need to go to the next thing. How does that feel? I just kind of want to touch on, is there a, a fear of failing in something new or kind of that transitional period you went through from teacher to psychotherapist? Because that's a big pivot. You're still able to go to your core, kind of that knowledge of the audience kind of player thing. But I'm sure there were moments where you had to kind of push through that fear if there was something central and you're right it was pretty scary but if there's something central to that pivoting mm -hmm. i love people i just love people mm -hmm. and i love being helpful and the truth is that i didn't decide to be a therapist until I had been through therapy myself and, and when I saw how valuable it was, when I, when I really got this feeling of how much more settled I felt and, and how my self-esteem had come you know, out of the garbage and, and into something that's really positive, I looked at the therapist that I had at the time and I said, you know, I think I could do this work. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, yeah, I think you could. So what has been central to every time I pivot is helping people. And that's even true of becoming an author. What I really wanted when I wrote my book, and this is pretty late in life, was I wanted the book to help people understand that relationships could be healed. 
Yeah. So I think I think that would be my central theme is helping people. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you, like you would say, that's kind of your calling, right? Like it, it just is. kept pulling you. Yeah. What is the what is the title of your book? Flying with Dad. Flying with Dad. Flying um, with Dad. I, I'm assuming there's stories of your dad in the book. <laughs> You're absolutely, absolutely right. It's a it's a um, good assumption, right? <laughs> it's a good assumption. Um, in 2008, and this is subject that I really love talking about. But if in 2008. I was on the phone with my father, our normal Sunday phone call. Mm. And not when the Steelers were playing and not when the Pirates were playing, that was verboten. <laughs> and normally we would go through um, the latest doctor's appointment. He was 85 at the time. Um, what his dialysis treatment was like, um, how he's being treated by his caretakers. We would go through our normal litany. And then we would struggle to find something to talk about because I'm not a sports fan. So I didn't get into the talk of football and baseball. And on one evening, he told me this quirky, funny, off the wall story about being in the second world war. Mm. And I said, dad, let me get a pencil and paper. I want to take notes. What the heck do you <laughs> want to do that for? <laughs> but he went with me. And the very next phone call, I said, if you're willing, start at the beginning. And story after story after story started to unfold mm -hmm. from this man that I had no idea about. And somewhere along the line, it occurred to me, here were stories from an ordinary GI. He wasn't Eisenhower. He wasn't Roosevelt. He wasn't any of those big names. He hadn't fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He didn't fight in D-Day. He was an ordinary GI. And I did some research on the internet and I didn't find books that kind of flew in that direction. So I just started to write. And then I started to look for publishers and 11 years later, I had a book in my hand. Here we are. Here we are. Uh, I love that he decided to participate. Like he didn't really have to twist his arm. Like you were just kind of like, hey, listen, dad, like I need to just start from the beginning. I got the rest of it. Well, I, th I think all of the things that I've done in my life, the teaching, the stage, the, the, the therapy were really very helpful because I knew how to listen. Mm -hmm. And I knew how to ask those open-ended questions that would just get him to flow. And, and there's one story in particular that was the turning point between dad and I. Dad was uh, in Miami Beach for basic training. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, at the time, all of the GIs, believe it or not, were billeted in hotels. Miami Beach was no longer a tourist place. We're knee deep in the middle of the Second World War. The Air Corps needs a place to train these guys. Miami's a perfect place, all right? So I said to him, I said, well, what was the name of the hotel you were at? I don't remember. Well, where was it? Well, it was at the intersection of da-da-da-da and da-da-da-da. So I started doing a, a search on the internet. And I would copy and paste a picture and stick it in an email and send it to dad and say, is this the one? He said, no, that's not it. Took two or three tries. And then finally I sent one and he said, that's it. That's the one. Good work. Love you, dad. So I really believe that was the turning point in more of his stories coming out of him because he could see the kind of links that I would go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of being interested in his in his life. And of course, the more he told me, um, the better it was or the easier it was for me to ask him even more pointed questions. Like he told me about flashbacks. He told me about nightmares. My father would probably have been diagnosed with PTSD. Mm. And because I had my background, 
I could tell him that given his, what he witnessed, the horror of what he witnessed, that those nightmares and that flashback was normal. It's what happens to people who witness traumatic things. Nightmares are normal. Um, flashbacks are normal. And so 50 years after the war is over, my father is learning that there's nothing wrong, there was nothing wrong with him. Yeah. That he wasn't abnormal. And that he wasn't a man's man. My assumption up until this point, your father, was he more closed off before you guys kind of went through this journey and kind of this growth? He didn't, I've heard a lot of people from that generation don't talk about that time. They don't talk about what they did or what they saw. Was it that kind of? It was that, but it was also, um, he was just more comfortable with his sons. I mean, he could take his sons hunting. He could take his sons fishing. They could do that manly thing of just being in silence, doing what guys do. <laughs> but with his daughters, it was different. Now with my sister, it was better because my sister's a sports nut. Okay, so they could always get into those kinds of conversations. Um, but he and I did struggle. But given the book, I got the father I always wanted. And he got a daughter that he didn't know he had. And we were together for a no regrets final goodbye. That's, I was uh... able to be with him when he passed away. And I was able to make sure that he, I know this is hard to say and maybe hard for some of your listeners and viewers to hear, but he died the way he wanted to. Yeah. He died in his home. And he was he always say to me when we would talk about his death and dying, I want to go out of this house feet first. <laughs> That's my dream. Feet first. And he did. He yeah. did. You know, the EMTs put him on the gurney, took him down the stairs and put him into the ambulance to be taken to the emergency room to be pronounced. And believe it or not, this is Meadville, Pennsylvania. The snow is falling an inch an hour. The driveway's getting covered. The ambulance doors are open, so there's lots of light. And I'm going, yes! And the EMTs are looking at me like I'd lost my last head or only had I had, and I said, you have just given my father his wish. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as hard it is, as it is to lose this man I loved, it was, it was a profoundly glorious experience because given the book and his trusting me with his advanced directives, living will, five yeah. wishes. Okay. His trusting me that I was able to call the hospital and say, there's a DNR, there's a do not resuscitate order on dad's chart, get it to the emergency room. And the, e, the emergency room doctor was able to call the EMTs and say, you can stop working on it. Yeah. So I was with him when he passed. And that's, that's a direct result of the book. Yeah, it's that relationship that you worked on and you kind of built on after that point. And then I'm sure not only just having his wishes, you know, fulfilled, but having this beautiful story, like a physical thing of his life and all of these things that could have been completely, you know, into the wind if you didn't try to go for that relationship and talk to him about those hard things. It has to be so rewarding. The very last visit I had with dad in the hospital, um, I had taken the first draft of the book and I sat by his bedside and I read some of the things from the book. And when it was time to leave, I was going to be driving six and a half hours back to the other side of the state. Um, Dad was still holding the draft and I looked at him and I said, I'm so proud of you. And he said, what for? And I said, your service during the war. And he said, oh, no, honey, I'm proud of you. You wrote the book. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine being a daughter and you're in your mid-60s, hearing your father say something like that to you, 
it's worth everything. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's gotta be incredible. You know, it, it's something interesting to hear you, you know, talk about him finally sharing a story. My grandfather uh, was kind of a part of World War II, um, but there was always this kind of assumption that I had from the little bit that I did get to hear of, oh, he didn't really participate in like the crazy part of it, right? Um, and that as far as I got to go with the story, I had questions and I tried to ask them, but he was not a, a man that really wanted to talk about stuff, right? And maybe mm-hmm. maybe I just didn't have the understanding when I was younger of how to kind of probe using the right questions. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does, it does make me curious. Uh, I really want to check out your book because I think it, it would be really... Uh, enjoyable to hear those stories. The other thing that kind of came to my mind while you were speaking is how I know not everyone would want someone to come up to them and be like, all right, man, I want you to start from the beginning and I'm going to write a book about it. I think a lot of people would be like, hey, no, I didn't sign up for this. But I genuinely believe that if a lot of us did have the opportunity, uh, especially if it was from someone that we, we knew and we trusted, we would love to tell our whole life story, right? I'm pretty uh-huh. sure, even though even though I'm, I'm I'm not like you, like I didn't want to get on the stage and have the spotlight on me, right? I think I would genuinely love to have that experience with someone where I tell them everything and they write a story, right? Um, I'm very happy to be able to hear that you got to have that experience, right? Where you were able to complete that that task, which. I've never written a book, but I, I assume it takes a little bit of time. It takes a lot of thought, it takes a lot of effort. Um, he would tell me things and I would go, no way. And he would go, yes way. So back to Miami Beach, he contracts amoebic dysentery, which causes heavy duty diarrhea. Okay. So in basic training, they were on the beach doing calisthenics and all that kind of physical training. And he gets the urge and he goes over to the slit trench, okay? And a slit trench is this deep hole dug in the sand and he does his, he does his things, but he's so weak from the dehydration, he fell in. Oh, no. oh God. And they, I know. It was they, so much they, worse than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the guys, in his troop came over, picked him up, threw him in the ocean, okay? They took him to the hospital and he was treated with arsenic. Oh my and I said, dad, no way. And he said, yes way. So whenever he would do that, I would research. And absolutely positively, arsenic was used in 1943 as a treatment for amoebic dysentery because it killed the bacteria. They, it was minor doses. So penicillin had been discovered mm. by the British, much too expensive, much, much too expensive until they brought it to the United States. But penicillin was not readily available till 1945. Wow. So as a part of all of these stories, I wanted to research and to get more background, you know, so the book is filled with not just dad's stories, but the additional things that I needed to find out. Um, he was in Texas for pre-flight gunnery school navigation. And I don't know from Texas. So I got on a plane, flew to San Antonio, rented a car and drove to all of the, of what, where the air bases would have been Mm -hmm. so that I could get a feel for that section of the book when I, when I went to write it, that I would have more of a sense of what Texas was all about. That is incredible. Uh, I love the fact that you didn't just tell a story and have people kind of comprehend it uh, just willy nilly, however they did. You allowed to provide the understanding behind it, right? Because I did not know that. Um, yeah, you I- literally, yeah, you literally said that, and I was like, "How did he not die? Is this man <laughs> Superman? Like what?" Uh, I mean, you know, that whole experience in itself had to be difficult. But then they're like, "Hey, to top it off, we're gonna sprinkle some arsenic on it, like a little what? poison." Yeah, yeah. 
Don't worry, but you're going to feel great. In that same sense, um, one of the things that was really important to me is imagine being in a non-pressurized plane, a B-24. I've been in one. I've flown in one. If you stand on this little nine-inch narrow catwalk in the middle of the plane, I'm not a big person. If I put my arms out like this, it's almost as if I could touch the sides mm. of the fuselage. 22,000 feet above the ground, 40 degrees below zero, wearing oxygen masks that if they weren't on exactly the right way would freeze. Two minutes in a frozen mask and you were done. Flying through the air and having incendiary bombs come up, what we call flak, bursting into shrapnel and ripping those planes apart and watching crews fall out of the sky in front of you. Mm. I wanted that sense also to come across in the book of, of what Air Corps and Air Force men did during the war. And, and it wasn't just them. It was the infantry and the folks on the ground, uh, the kind of thing that they went through. I think it's important for us to understand that you know, to get a sense of, of who these guys were. And the research that I did around courage, it wasn't, it wasn't Hitler, it wasn't duty, it wasn't any of those things. It was the love of their crew. Yeah. Dad was in Charleston, South Carolina once he left Texas and he trained with his crew. And this is the crew that he flew overseas with. It was that camaraderie. It was that sense of duty, yes, but it's duty to one another that made them be able to do what they did. Yeah. Um, you don't have to answer this question, but I am curious, uh, maybe from your own perspective, or maybe maybe your father had a perspective that maybe you got to hear. Um, there are hundreds of World War II movies out there. Um, do you think that they portray portray it in in a realistic light in any way? Or do you think most of it's just, it's very Hollywood kind of, you know, they had to make a movie, right? They, they had to mm -hmm. entertain. Um, but do you think people get kind of the visual of like what these people went through? Um, my dad loved Memphis Belle. He wanted okay. us to see that. All right. I have seen it. Um, I, I'm not necessarily sure that it comes to anywhere near yeah. what it was. When I think of a movie that gives a sense of what it's like, I think of Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. Okay. That one, as hard as it was to watch the, those guys hit the beach and all the blood and all the death, right. I thought, that that really brought the picture home of of really what d-day was all about yeah uh i'm gonna tell you a funny story uh which you're like sam harrow did we go from d-day to a funny story <laughs> right uh but let me let me get there so um i joined the marine corps in 2010 and i got to go to boot camp and do the whole you know i did four years so I'm in boot camp and, you know, they have you like crawling through the mud and there's barbed wire uh, and you're, and there's like loud noises. And I think trace arounds that they're shooting overhead, which whether we were safe or not, didn't matter. I was at boot camp, Right. So I'm crawling and I'm hearing screaming and gunfire. There's obviously speakers everywhere. There's, you know, in-person things happening as well, just to cause stress and whatever. And I'm crawling, I'm in the mud. There's a part of me that's kind of like, excited about it right like i'm in this crazy situation i never imagined being in and then all of a sudden i go is that tom hanks and, and i'm not kidding i'm like crawling under barbed wire and there's like phew, phew. and i'm like what is going on because all i can focus on is tom hanks and i'm hearing voices i'm hearing screaming explosions whatever and again i'm hearing tom hanks and i put the pieces together and what they were doing is they were playing the audio Oh my God. from saving private Ryan at the beginning of that movie while we're doing this training that we were doing. And as much as I wanted to kind of laugh at it and uh, just how silly the experience was, you know, I was in it and I was just trying to accomplish the, the goal at the time. 
but I, I think that I just want to reiterate that I, I would agree with you. I think a lot of people would say that the, the way they put the movie together, I think they did their research, right? They, I think they mm -hmm. did the interviews and I think they did try their hardest to convey as best as they could a realistic, this is what happened, right? And I think, I think they did a good job. I mean, when you watch that movie, you don't sit there comfortably, you know, it's a little hard to watch. Um, but it does. It's something I'll, I'll never forget is when I was a little kid, I was listening to Tom Hanks play, uh, you know, a character in Toy Story. And then, you know, I'm in my early 20s and I'm crawling around in the mud listening to him <laughs> scream from, you know, Saving Private Ryan. Well, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg are, I think, filming at this very time a new series called Masters of the Air. And it will be about the 100s, which was a B-17 base uh, in Thorpe Abbots, which is in England. Um, and it will be interesting to me if I'm even going to be able to go and watch that series, given you know that, that real strong feeling. When we were watching the movie, obviously i'm crying i'm just sobbing the tears are i mean it's just and my stepdaughter was with us mm. and um when the movie was over she looked at me and she said i now understand why you and dad were crying when we were at the american cemetery in normandy beach we had taken the kids on a european trip and that's one of the places that we stopped. Yeah. And you're looking out over the sea of crosses, you know, as, as you look out to the ocean and that's that cliff that you don't understand how in the world they ever were able to scale it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the Caroline comes on and plays the national anthem. And then they play God Bless America. And then they play American Beauty, or Amer America the Beautiful. And my husband and I are just streaming and our teenage kids are looking at us like, what in the world, you yeah. know, is happening here? But at the end of Private Ryan, she had a sense. I, and I said to her, I said, my father wasn't on the ground, Kate. He was up in the air. Yeah. But this still gives me more of a realistic sense of what he experienced. Well, yeah. the the energy that had to be felt between him and and the others that he served with or just the entire world during that time um it, it had to be a struggle every day to just fathom what was happening right i mean it was so extravagant and how large that was um and you know i i find it interesting that you know we do have these these people who go you know what all right i'm going to talk about it you know, and even like the kind of funny stories, right, of like falling into the into the, the little trench and then being thrown <laughs> into the ocean, right? Like they're able to share the embarrassing stuff, but also, you know, you're you're not wrong. Like he probably definitely had symptoms of PTSD. I mean, how could you make it through that and not? So the recurring nightmare lasted for three years. Mm. And in the nightmare... The plane that he was in had been hit by flak. They were going down. He had his parachute on and he had this kind of narrow passageway that he had to get through in order to get to the bomb bay to bail out. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't get purchase. He couldn't get anything to pull himself through because this passageway was lined with stainless steel. He said to me that the nightmares were so bad that he ripped holes through the sheets and into the mattress. And they finally had to buy a second mattress because the holes were just too deep. My mother couldn't stuff them anymore. Yeah. Um, they lasted for three years. And then finally, for some whatever reason, they went away. But when he was having them and he was screaming in his sleep, mom would wake him up. And she would say, what is it? And he'd say, it's nothing. Just go back to sleep. It took him years to be able to say that. So to be able to say to dad, you know, nightmares are not fun. 
They didn't know at the end of the war what we know now. Um, you would have been able to get some help to help you make those go away sooner than three years. But nightmares are normal for people who witness any kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a way of our brain trying to work through whatever it was that happened. Now let's flip because you were telling a humorous story. So I have another. The oh, opening perfect. salvo with my dad is they're flying across Belgium. They lose their third engine. Dad's the navigator. He said, we need to land. Okay, we cannot head to the English Channel and fly across the English Channel on three engines. Not a good idea. So they radioed and they were told to go to Brussels and dad as the navigator said, no, we need to land sooner. So they landed at Liège, Belgium. And at that point, Belgium was free. Liège was a hospital base. There were so many wounded people that there was no room at the inn. So they loaded dad's crew onto a truck, drove into the center of Liège and they're billeted above a bistro. Not a bad spot to have to take <laughs> a little R&R yeah. to be above a bar. So the bar owner comes up to dad and, and says, do you have American cigarettes? Well, of course they did. That was a part of their sea rations that they took on the plane because American cigarettes could be bartered to get them out of trouble if oh, something yeah. like this happened. So dad said, yeah, we have cigarettes. So dad commandeered a truck. They went out into the Belgian countryside in the middle of the night, pulled aside hay bales, dug down and unearthed cases of French champagne. Wow. Oh. Which promptly got loaded on to the repaired B-24 and flown back to Rakhith, which was my dad's air base. Dad went and commandeered a truck, also got the MPs, the military police, and said, watch this plane, because we're carrying top secret information. <laughs> they load the champagne on the truck and take it and divided it up between the non-coms and the officers. Oh, wow. And the following morning, I don't know whether they were supposed to go out on another bombing mission or whether they were going out for training, but Colonel Schauer, who was the commander of the base, was none too pleased with the condition of his men. Oh, but dad boy. said, all you really needed to do was go and get your mask and breathe pure oxygen. And that would clear your head, take the cobwebs away and off you went. That was the original story that got me going. Oh, wow. Uh, and that's a good one. That uh, is a good yeah. one. Yeah. All you need is a mask full of oxygen. We're good to go. The best right? hangover <laughs> cure that there is. Yeah. I just need to get an oxygen mask. I picture I picture <laughs> men parachuting out of a plane, but they have like a like an IV just hydrating them as they're on their way down. Like, here we go. We're doing this. So you say these kinds of things and they lead into more stories. And one of the first couple of missions that dad was on. Um, they were coming back from either Germany or France. And lo and behold, they did experience flak. And they saw planes going down all around them. My dad said to me, I was so scared, I peed myself. And when yeah. I peed myself, I short circuited my electric heat suit. Oh. Remember, they're 22,000 feet above the ground. It's 40 degrees below zero. This is not a good situation. Right. So he gets on the interphone and he says to the pilot, we're really close to the English Channel. The minute you hit it, drop this thing down to an altitude so I don't freeze to death. So they flew in low over the English Channel and back to Rakeith. And he was fine. Wow. It's so it's so strange, too, because. in in my brain, when I think about the wars that have happened, uh, I know that it's it's been a while, but it doesn't seem that long ago, right? But the situation in itself allowed for 
like him just to be able to go like, hey, listen, this is the situation. This is how we have to act or people are going to die, right? And so the pilot was probably like, okay, let's save some lives and made it happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's it's one thing that's hard for a lot of people to kind of wrap their head around, right? Unless you like mm-hmm. really try and do the research to understand of how insane that, that whole situation was, right? Like you're in the air, the plane's taken. Yeah. Um, There's so flat. many things that can go wrong just with the plane was, itself. If it was like a normal day and then, yeah, yeah. And then all these things are happening and yet somehow they like drop altitude, make it all the way through and survive it. Um, and there's no medic on board. No. They're all taught. They're all taught how to give shots of morphine if somebody's wounded. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, th- there's um, Donald Miller has written a book on the Eighth Air Force, and it's about Yay Big. And there's a whole chapter called "The Dangerous Skies," and he really lays it out exactly how dangerous it was to be flying. And the B twenty four was also nicknamed the Flying Coffin because the fuel lines were on the inside of the fuselage. So if you got hit, you know, they burst into flame. So um, no, I I, I just really had, it was the research beyond dad stories that helped me to get the full depth. And and when I wrote the book, I wanted that to be in there as well. For sure. Because dad kind of, he didn't skim the surface. He didn't, but in a way he did, you know, it's mm-hmm. that paradoxical kind of thing. So I wanted the reality of what it is that my father experienced so that you're a grandson, you know, so that you might get an understanding of what your grandfather went through. So mm-hmm. uh, people of my generation, so that we would get an understanding of, of what our parents went through at that time. Um, that was one of the things that I was really trying to um, to get. And one of the really good things too is that my mother saved every letter my father wrote. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So um, the book is independently published. Um, and when I finally decided on a publisher, I sent her my third draft. I said 11 years. Yeah. And she took it and threw it in a blender and gave it back to me. And she said, this is what I want you to do. Section one, how you and your father were disconnected, what your family was kind of like growing up in the 1950s, 1960s. Section two, your father's story. Section three, how the writing of the book brought you and your dad together. In section two, she said, I want you to write this in your father's voice. And I'm like, what? You know, I, I, I mean, I'm used to writing term papers, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and so how am I supposed to do this? And then it occurred to me, I've got all these, I've got all these letters. So as I wrote each chapter, I would read those letters to get a real sense of, of how dad would say things or how he would put it. So I had the luxury of, of that as well. And Dad. that's that, awesome. That had, that had to be wild for you. I mean, you were literally sitting there reading letters in his voice. I mean, that's how he writes, hopefully, right? As from yeah. his perspective. And you were able to just hold that. I mean, that's that's a piece of history, you know? And that's the, it keeps kind of bringing up for me, um, my grandma who passed in the last few years, she wrote a 30 page just monologue about her life in the nineties, just everything that had happened up until that point with her and her kids, like how she met my grandpa, all of that. And it was just kept somewhere and we found it after her passing. And it was such a weird little capsule because you do get their tone and their voice and a little bit of their personality. And then all this just added details that you wouldn't get always in talking to them that they add in writing. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy to have that family history and it's so rare. And I think that's why it makes your story so unique that you saw the beauty of that and you 
got as much of it as you could in that relationship and kind of maintaining that history. I got to ask well, a question. You, okay. So when, when all this is happening, you said it, it was an 11 years from, hey, dad told me the first story and we got all the way to it's published, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. You have letters that he wrote. You obviously have firsthand him telling you about it, but then you're like traveling to different places in the world to put pieces together and make sure there's an understanding, right? Mm -hmm. There was no way during all of this traveling and stuff, you didn't have any shenanigans happen, right? Like were there, were there things where you're like, hey, I'm going to travel to here so I can get an understanding of this part of the story. And then you got there and just things kind of happened. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Positively. I have been to Rakhis in England probably five or six times. Um, my husband and I sing in the church choir and we sing in the community choir and we travel internationally. And anytime I'm in England, look out, folks, I'm going to Rakhis. So the people who have welcomed me in Rakhis. My father was, on, he was a ham radio. This is another story. He was a ham radio operator and he's twisting the dials and hearing the squelch and all this kind of stuff. And he hears a British voice and they do their 73s and which is the way that you sign on and they get to talking and dad says, I was in the second world war and I was stationed at Rack Keys. Do you know that? And the guy on the other end, the English guy says, yeah. He said, I was a kid. I lived not very far from there. So Ian, the British man, sends dad a package in the mail with newspaper clippings and pictures and photos. They ended up having a almost 11, 15 year relationship. They would wow. speak over the, they would speak first over ham radio. And then when computers offered that, they did that. They visited each other. Um, when I've gone, Ian and Sue have, have been gracious and have taken me places and taken my family places. So there's that. Um, there's going to Texas to San Marcos. And San Marcos has a commemorative Air Force Museum. And it's in a hangar. And the hangar was one of the original World War II hangars. It's where dad trained to be a navigator. And I walked in and told them a little bit of my story. And the, uh, the CEO of the museum took me around, Clint Epley. And he said, come here, I wanna show you this. Okay. So he walks me over to the side. He said, this is our prize possession. It was a C-47. Now, C-47 transport plane during the Second mm -hmm. World War, and it was the plane that led the, let's say, the Armada to drop folks in to D-Day. It was wow. the lead plane. So here I am, and he said, by the way, this would be the plane that your father would have trained on. And look up there, you can see that plexiglass. That was the way your dad would do celestial navigation where he would learn that. So those kinds of things happened to me a lot. Wow. Here's the best. So I post things on Facebook, okay? And, and through Facebook, there's a comment in the comment comment section that my grandfather was at the 467th with your father. Can I get a book for him to read? He's 103. Well, you betcha, I'm going to get him a book. So I said, okay, how do I do this? And she said, it, it would be through my mother. And okay, so where does she live? She lives in Allentown, PA. That's 17 miles from me. And oh. then in her notes, she said, my grandfather lives in a personal care home nearby. Well, which one? The Lutheran home in Telford. I've done trainings there. It's 7.2 miles away from my house. So 
COVID lockdown, I deliver everything. They take it up. I talked to his daughter. She said, I want you to know he read 120 pages of your book last night. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so we, we start ready. having... The, we start having this relationship, and on April 27th, 19, or last year, I wrote the story of my, my father being on a training mission and the plane crash that he was in. And his granddaughter wrote back and said, my grandfather was the assistant crew chief for that plane. The plane was called the Wabbit, W-A-B-B-I-T. So I get on the phone with Joe and I said, Joe, did you happen to see the plane after the crash? And he said, oh yeah. He said, the nose wheel had collapsed. They nose dived into the field. He said, the nose, now it's plexiglass, was disintegrated. He said, if anybody had been in the nose of the plane, they wouldn't have walked away. My father's normal position was in the nose of the plane. And because it was a training mission, he crawled up through the escape hatch, slid to the wing, jumped to the ground and broke his leg. He was the only injury of all of the six crew that were on that training mission. I was born 20 months later. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> COVID kind of opens up. I get to go visit. Um, Joe's on one side of a sliding glass door. I'm on the other side. We're speaking through a speakerphone. It gets better and we can at least sit outside with our masks on. And because both Joe and I are vaccinated, now I am allowed to go to his room. So I said to him on one of my visits, did you ever get close to any of the crew? And he said, no. He said, I didn't want to know if they didn't come back. He said, but yeah. there was one crew and they didn't come back. So I said, give me some names. The 467th Bomb Group Association is really vibrant and they have a great researcher. And if you go on their website, you can just find oodles of information. So I contacted Peter and I said, can you see if you can find out what happened to the crew that Joe was talking about? Joe gave me the name S-T-O-U-D-T. Peter got back to me and said, nope, there's no crew name by that, by that name. Get some more name. So Joe gave me another one, Damien Murray. Damien Murray was the pilot of that crew. And crews were named for their pilots. So it would have been the Murray crew. So Peter sent back all of this typewritten information that I was able to take to Joe. The plane did go down because of flak. Nine out of the 10 crew members aboard survived. They were picked up by the Germans and taken to POW camps. And when the Russians started marching in, they went on those awful death marches. Mm -hmm. But every one of those nine men survived and were freed when the allies came in and came home. Peter went on with his Ancestry um, ticket, Ancestry.com ticket, and literally had pictures of the graves of these men to show how long they had lived after that. So I'm handing all this information to Joe, and his words were, it's so nice to know after all these years, 76 yeah. years later. It's that closure. So, yeah. so the book has had all these hidden gifts for me. You know, um, I just got back from seeing Joe before our, our conversation, 104. Wow. Is he still uh, running around a lot or is he just kind of taking it easy? Um, if you Google Yvonne Caputo, Joe Hahn, H-A-E-N-N, W-F-M-Z, you will be able to see a little two minute news report on the two of us. And you'll watch him really kind of take off with his walker. I'm going to have to because yeah, I, yeah. Just, I just took a little note. Okay. He's 
with it. He's clear as a bell. Um, he reads voraciously. Um, he has been the salve or balm or whatever you want to call it to my COVID existence because mm -hmm. I can look forward to my visit with Joe. But if you can imagine, here's somebody that was responsible for the care and the flight worthiness of a plane that my father was in when it crashed. Yeah. And he's alive and he's able to tell me about it. Um, I gotta tell you, uh, it, this, this, is a, this is a very amazing conversation, right? Um, and I'm glad we were able to uh, kind of focus on the book. Um, it's something that I, I very much want to read and kind of absorb. Again, I think there's a part of me that's curious of some of the stories in the book, because I, I do wonder sometimes, right? My, my grandfather passed years ago, um, and he was in one way or the other involved with World War II. But, you know, I, I just think it a firsthand, you know, uh, expression about what he went through. Um, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I do want to give you an opportunity. If you have any words of maybe wisdom or advice or, you know, anything you would like to say, right, um, to our listeners, um, this would be your opportunity to kind of share that, right, of maybe how to write a book or how to look at things, right? As I said earlier, when we were getting to know each other, I listened to a couple of your podcasts. I wanted to get a feel of who you were and the kind of work that you did. Kudos. Um, Thank you. I am now what I call deliciously semi-retired. I like that. Um, I like that. <laughs> I, I'm still active. I'm still engaged. I still work. I wish we would take the word failure and put it in a dustbin mm. because it's such an ominous word. I failed. Along the way, I would really like it and prefer that we said, you know, that was a mistake. And, and by the way, any decision we make, we really don't know whether it's a good decision or a bad decision until after the fact. Mm. It took you a while, Megan, to discover that job wasn't the right one for you. Exactly. That's not who or where you want it to be. <laughs> um, so so if, if we look at things rather, okay, well, that was a mistake. What do I need to learn from it? How do I need, need to move forward? I think it's so much easier psychologically than to say I was a failure or that was a mm -hmm. failure. I feel that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're 100% right. And I think some of us get stuck. I've been there. I know other people that have been there where you get hung up on, oh, God, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make the decision, right? Because you don't really get to know for sure until hindsight lets you know, uh -huh. right? Um, and I, and I, I definitely uh, see where you're coming from, right? Of that's what we're trying to do, right? Uh, I, I think almost as an entire planet, we're trying to shift now and try to try to change things and create new meanings and habits and things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I really uh, adore about our conversation today is that um, during this time and through this experience of like creating that book, you were able to get a very um, rich look at history uh, that I think a lot of us couldn't even imagine. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing that with us today. I feel incredibly blessed. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, incredibly blessed that I, that life planted me in this spot, A, to be um, retired so I could spend the time that the book needed to have. But even more so, you know, all my steps along the way of drama in high school, drama in college, being a teacher, all those kinds of things that led to me having the ability to have this deep conversation with this man I called my father mm -hmm. and, and to end up being able to have him trust me 
with his final goodbye, to trust me that I was gonna make it happen the way that he had wanted to have it happen. I mean, how rich is that? I am it's, so incredibly blessed. Yeah. It feels like one in a million, if I'm honest with you. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful to hear that you got to do that for him and, and to be a part of it. I think it was an experience that I think it sounds like you kind of cherish, right? Like it's not easy letting go of someone, but being able to let them kind of go on their, on their terms, right? Kind of their, right. this is the way I want it to be, right? Um, to to understand know. fully for your audience, do I miss my dad? Oh my God, yes. Do I have questions I want to ask him? Absolutely. Could I just relish in hearing that deep, resonant voice yell at me <laughs> once again? Absolutely. But I'm working on my second book. What I, what I want in the second book is for people to be more comfortable having these open discussions with the people that they love mm -hmm. because it means so much. When we were sitting with the priest and talking about dad's funeral, my brother said, the, Father Gramada said, what do you want? And my brother said, well, gee, I, I really don't know what's standard for a Roman Catholic mass. And I said, I know what he wanted. And so I said, he wants this and he wants this and he wants this and he doesn't want this. He did not want people standing up at his funeral talking about him. He said, if they haven't said it to my face, don't bother saying it at the funeral. So <laughs> that's my dad. There you go. So, so, so being able to look back on that experience and just having people be more comfortable and even folks as young as you, my granddaughter just finished her last chemo treatment for like leukemia, 40 months. She had to do a, a document called the five wishes, which is advanced directives. She had to think about that at the age of graduating from high school. So wow. even for, for those of you who, who are young to kind of, it's a given, we don't know when, we don't know where, but to lay it out so that the people who love us know what we want and how we want to be treated it is a gift that my father gave me. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Uh, and that's deep. Because uh, I, I know that we all have that moment, right? Where we're like... Yeah, we kind of know what's going to happen, right? We have, we have, we all have the general idea, but to force the self to go, okay, hey, maybe this isn't a bad idea to think about. Even if, even if, uh, you know, I'm 33 now and I'm not going to pass away until I'm 93, it's okay to have that kind of laid out for someone to find or, or to talk about. Um, and I'm sure it's not an easy conversation, right? Like you, it's not meant to be some brisk walk in the yeah. park, but like you said, it's a gift, right? For when the, when the time comes, it's a gift for somebody that it's left putting the final pieces together, you know? Obviously, by the time I sat down and did it with my father, there was this beginning of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And he had said to me many times over the phone, I want to go. I'm just tired. I want to go. Uh, so there was that piece of it. So when we sat down to do the document, when he was in the hospital one time, the five wishes is so well laid out. It is such a beautiful document that it takes you step by step. So it creates a way to talk about it in, um, in what you might find would be a much easier way. It's pretty clinical and it's pretty factual about end of life and do you want life sustaining measures or not but where it differs from advanced directives is it asks questions like how do you want to be remembered oh yeah what do you do you want to be buried or do you want to be cremated um what do you want your family to know you know um those those kind of things so 
it takes advanced directives to a totally different level. I am definitely going to actually look into that. It's called the Five uh, Wishes. It's online. It's five dollars. Yeah, might and, as well, right? And yeah, the whole time I'm kind of thinking. I've already had this conversation. Like me and my close friends, my best friend and my husband, we've been like, "This is what I want." If I if I'm gone for some reason, and it's it seems morbid because we're young, but it the the whole thought of it's never too late. It's never too late until it actually is. So it's good to just, even though it's a scary, not fun topic, it's an important one. Mm -hmm. So just making that jump, nothing, you're not going to fail to talk about it. It's just going to be uncomfortable for a little bit, but it, it brings a lot of value. Yeah. And Megan, if I can say, having those conversations is great that you're having them at your age. But if it's not in a document and if it's not so oh, yeah. delivered, you know, yeah. you can't do it. <laughs> it is yeah. Yeah, not official. <laughs> not official. Um, he told me in passing one night while he was drinking that he didn't <laughs> want to be resuscitated. He told you this while he was drunk? Yeah, but he meant it, okay? He, he meant it, right? Uh, um, well, hey, uh, again, I, I did want to thank you for joining us today. I have very much enjoyed this conversation. Uh, we have entered that part of the podcast uh, where Megan has to talk about social media. It is time. And first of all, I want to call out your book. It's called Flying with Dad. And can they find that just at any book retailer on Amazon? Any independent store will order it for them. Any online retailer will get it to them. Yes. Awesome. So we're going to buy our copies as soon as we get off. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then for our socials, it's the regular stuff. You can find us at Friends of Failure on any of the platforms. Uh, if you're listening on audio, we are also on YouTube under Friends of Failure. And we want to reach out again and ask for you guys to rate, review, kind of let us know how you're feeling. Give us that feedback. Let us know what you want to see. And the best part of all, uh, we're going to ask for your failures now. Uh, these can be serious or they can be silly, kind of like the, the beach incident that we heard about today, <laughs> mm. falling in the latrine a little bit. Um, and you can either email those or call those in. You can email at friendsoffailurepodcast at gmail.com and you can leave us a voicemail at 916-304-3345. There we go. I did want to add, I did want to add, because now I'm curious, right? Um, after you said your thing of looking at it from the perspective of calling it a mistake, there are mistakes that we have made and, and we learned from, right? Uh, and that's kind of where we're coming from. Of you, you endure failure, you learn from it, you you make the correction, um, and then you you move forward. And the goal is to get to success, whatever that looks like. Uh, I, you know, to whoever's listening or watching right now, one hundred percent don't don't look at it as sharing a negative story share a life experience right you yeah. you could change somebody's life right um and you know don't put that weight on your shoulders if you're if you don't want that but i'm just saying that you know this is an opportunity where you can be heard by strangers anonymously or by name um and and people might find hope or faith or you know find someone that they kind of relate to and they don't feel as alone right um, but that's my two cents on that. I, I really think that if if you've thought about it, if, if you've thought about it even once, it's like, ah, you know what? I should send an email or, or make that phone call. Just do it. Trust your gut. Go for it. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Um, also, Facebook 2008. All right. So oh, God, uh, there it is. That, that's, that's the show for today, guys. Uh, and as usual, I would like to leave you guys with uh, one final thought. Uh, and that is life is happening for you, not to you. So go out there and fail. If it's not I'm stronger than you, it's I'm wiser than you. I'm more loving than you. I'm more tolerant than you. I'm more sophisticated than you. It doesn't matter what it is, but this constant competition is going on. This is the secret. This is the secret.
can't make a mistake.